From Tinkerbell to Artie Shaw to George Bush's Thousand Points of Light, America has been mesmerized by stardust since its very inception. And now America is beginning to learn what all these references to the star, the morning star, wish upon a star, stardust, really is all about. The Bible tells us that Cain was a tiller of the ground. That's really interesting because in translation I found all sorts of things have got misconstrued. This is a brilliant example of it. A straight translation from what the original text says is not Cain was a tiller of the ground, but Cain had dominion over the earth. <laughs> That's kind of different, isn't it? Cain, the Sumerian records tell us, and the Hebrew records tell us, was born by a father whom the Hebrew calls Samael, and who the Sumerian records call Enki, one of the Anunnaki, and he was called the Lord of Samael simply because he was the Lord of Samael. That was a city in, in Syria at the time. So the Hebrews called him Samael, and Samael has a sort of Satan connotation these days, but it didn't. It was simply the name of a, a city, and he was in charge of it in, in those times. So Cain we have as a character who, whose blood is really heightened. His father is pure Anunnaki, his mother is half-bred Anunnaki, and from her comes the gene. And we get back to exactly what Jay-Z mentioned earlier, who the hell did he marry? Because this is the guy who the Bible tells us had a wife and had a series of sons, important sons and descendants, called Enoch, Tubal Cain, Lamech, and others who, who we learn lots about, but whose story in Genesis just suddenly disappears and gets taken over by stories of Noah and people like that. This family was the key to the royal bloodline. They were the great Vulcans. They were the kings, and they were the most heightened clones, as they called them at the time. Clones. We call it clones now. The word didn't have an E in it. It was clones. Clon meant twig. They were the most important twigs, or as we might say, branches, of something they called the vine. They were the clones of the vine. Vine, of course, was the grail. The grail was the bloodline. According to not just Mesopotamian texts, but even Hebrew texts, even Hebrew texts of the period say, not that Cain slew Abel and spilled his blood on the ground. What they say is, Cain's blood was so advanced that in relation to his brother Hevel, his brother's blood was earthbound by comparison. Cain, it was said in the old scriptures, rose far above Abel. What we have in our modern text is Cain rose up against Abel. It's not the same thing at all. It was making the point that his line was supreme, it was superior, it was the purposefully bred, cloned, branched, kingly line, which was the first clue I got when I started out on the second book to answer the question, Yes, the bloodline of the Holy Grail is important, but what was so special about the bloodline in the first place? What was so special about it was that it was purpose-bred to be the Adama, the earthling leaders of mankind, whom the early texts call Lulu, which again was contrived, a hybrid line. The Anunnaki knew that they were not going to be around forever running and building these cities. They knew that mankind would have to take care of his own destiny and have his own governors. So the best they could do for him was to produce this race of, of kingly beings. And that their bloodline was heightened to an enormous degree that they were almost like gods themselves. They had a feeding process which they called the tree of knowledge and the tree of life. And if you remember the phrase in Genesis, where Adam actually took from the fruit of the tree, Jehovah actually said to the other gods, the other gods, Genesis says this, behold, the man has become like one of us. 
he has become almost like a god himself. And that was the root of the kingly line. It was bred to be almost like gods. And this was what perpetuated into Egypt with the pharaohs. These people were, were bred and fed and perpetuated in a dimension which was above the norm in terms of awareness and consciousness, general understandings and abilities. Starfire in Jewish circles became something which they were taught to avoid like the plague. Starfire was belonged to this other line. This belonged to the, the senior kingly line. This is a line of important superior beings and Jehovah wants us to have nothing to do with that. We are supposed to be subordinate subjects. We must not take the starfire. Starfire was related to blood and hence the dictate was made that Jews should avoid the ingestion of blood. The practice revolved around purely and simply feeding this line of kings with the menstrual blood of the Anunnaki goddesses. So we have these, these Anunnaki goddesses who are mothers and also virgins and, and they have a lot of titles and names, but in essence their job was to provide the starfire to feed the kingly line. They were designated flowers. They were the flowers. And they were defined generally by the symbol of a lily or a lotus flower. And the word flower comes exactly from that root. It comes from the godly flowers. Now it's interesting if you remember what I said earlier that, that most of the laboratory equipment that they found in the Sinai temple, the vases and bowls and all of that, were all shaped like lilies and lotus flowers. But this re exactly this reason. Am I turning off? No. And so, so the flower, she who flows, they were called lilies and they were given names. So you find it in um, Anunnaki documentation, an ancient Sumerian record all the time. The characters were called Lily. They were called Lulava, the wife of Cain. They were called Lith. They were called Lilutu, they were called Lilet. All of these names determined that these were Anunnaki flowers, producers of starfire. So, I mean, most of you know about the functions of the pineal and pituitary glands, but in fact, the records of ancient Sumer tell us that they perfected a ramifying medical science of living substances to feed this line. And starfire was the essential source ingredient. It was called the gold of the gods. It was fed only to the kings and the queens of the royal succession. It was also called the vehicle of light, being the ultimate source of manifestation. And in this regard, it was, re it was equated with the waters of creation. So suddenly, light, waters, all of these words are all coming in. And these are the emblems that we find in the Sinai temple. Light, water, bread, all of this stuff. It all comes back starfire origin, feeding the pharaohs, feeding the kings, feeding the blood line. And it was for this reason that the original emblem of Cain, the mark of Cain that was placed on him was not a curse, it was actually a, a coat of arms. The oldest recorded grant of arms in sovereign history in the world, the Red Cross within a circle. It was called the mark of Cain, the emblem of kingly line was also called the cup of the waters. The cup of the waters, when translated later into a sort of um, Greco-Roman, was Rosicrucis. And from Rosicrucis, of course, come the Rosicrucians, everything associated with, with, with knowledge of, of this practice. This was the knowledge that the early Rosicrucians held. They held the knowledge of the cup of the waters. The Dragon Court itself was founded by Queen Shebek Nefru back in oh, 1800, roughly, BC. That court still exists today. It's been through a number of changes, and it was essentially the court that most historians know about today was the version of it that was refounded in Hungary in 1408. And it was founded by Emperor Sigismund of Hungary. Now, he was a direct descendant of the kings of Jerusalem, so he didn't reinvent the dragon order. He inherited it through the family line. It had always been there, and he drew up a pact with nobles and princes of the line to protect the true sovereignty of the Grail dragon bloodline from the Anunnaki. He drew up a document at the time, and it said that you will, as 
members of this order be able to display the Ouroboros dragon with the red cross. That is the mark of Cain. Circular dragon biting its own tail with the red cross in the center. That was the emblem of the Rosicrucis. We are perpetuated within the royal lines from 3000 odd BC to 1408 BC, a continuation of exactly this dynasty. And they were heavy into alchemy. A sign similar to a cross signifying the sun was made on the forehead of the initiate, who was thus marked as owned by the deity. A crown was placed before him, hanging from the point of a sword. This he took and placed it aside with the words, Mithra alone is my crown. And this, folks, this takes place in every, every mystery that there have ever been. Remember when Christ went into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights and was tempted by Satan? Satan offered him the crowns of any or all of the nations of the earth if he would just follow him, and Christ rejected it. The same thing happens in the mystery school. The initiate is always offered a crown, sometimes by the king or the emperor himself. And if he accepts the crown, he's considered unworthy. And being, as it would be interpreted as a threat to the real wearer of the crown, probably would have been executed. It was considered only worthy if he rejected the crown symbolic of the ruler, the ruling of the nation or people or area. The Persian crown, it should be remembered, from which pattern all present day crowns are eventually derived, is a golden sun disk with a hole in the center for the head. It is jagged at the edges, representing the sun's rays, just like that worn by the Statue of Liberty. And these projections are turned up to make what is still known in Western heraldry as the Oriental Crown. You can also see this representation as the halo in Christian art. So what has all this got to do with stars and stardust? Many people believe that Venus is the morning star. In the ancient days, they say that it was Sirius that rose just before the sun with a red cast to it and then turned a brilliant white as it rose up into the heavens. Well, folks, if you really think about it, the sun is the morning star. Good night, and God bless each and every one of you. Tertullian, in his De Corona, which is Latin, for the crown, which he composed in the third Christian century, upbraids the Christians, inviting their attention to the Mithraeus as examples. De Corona actually means, means the crown of thorns. You, his fellow warriors, should blush when exposed by any soldier of Mithra when he is enrolled in the cave, he is offered the crown which he spurns, and he takes his oath upon this moment and is to be believed through the fidelity of his servants. The devil puts us to shame.